Hello there. This is Michael Cross with your one-hour show, Unlock the Door, featuring guests and commentary dealing with, well, just about everything. Social issues, psychological issues, manipulation, mind control, all sorts of those things that, well, I hope are very stimulating and get people to think. And while you may agree or disagree with what I say or what guests say, if you come away with this thinking, I wonder, and you start in your mind, it gets your mind working a little bit, then I think you've spent a good hour. And I hope you'll find that valuable. Anyway, um, my guest tonight is the mother of nine children. Her name's Anne. Um, she is someone who's been a friend with my wife, and I thought it would be kind of interesting to get a perspective on families that is very rarely seen in the mainstream media, uh, where basically family today is, well, just about anything, um, or the, um... Oh, I should, I should, I should counter that. It's almost everything except for people that you know are married and have a large family. That seems to be like the the only taboo that's out there, with a uh, very, very few exceptions to that. Uh, I just want to check here. Anne, are you on? Yeah, I'm right here, Mike. Great, because during the music, I uh, I noticed that the um, the call was lost temporarily, so I just wanted to make sure that was all taken care of. Anyway, um, now I'd like to just start off with just a, a quick, a quick um, statement of my interest in this. And uh, you know, I wrote a book, Freedom from Conscience, and then I did the sequel to it, Freedom from Conscience: uh, Melanie's Awakening. And whereas it's a story about uh, a young anti-hero, you know, she does really nasty things, but for the right reason. So kind of like a female Clint Eastwood slash psychopath, uh, psychological thriller. I, I use a lot of, I, I talk about a lot of social issues within um, the novels. And in the second novel, there's a real debate that takes place in regards to, of course, I think a lot of young women have this debate, in regards to family. And... Uh, She's involved with a person who doesn't want a family, although she's very much in love with that person. And it proceeds along these kinds of relationship uh, problems that come up. But in a real sense, I've met a lot of people in, in this kind of situation where it seems that what used to be uh, the norm where it was, okay, well, I'm going to get married, I'm going to have a family, I'm going to have a job so I can take care of my family – now that seems to be somewhat reversed. I'm going to get a job, and I'll get married if the right person comes along, and we might have a family if time and career uh, can mesh with that. And so nowadays there's lots and lots, I think it's record numbers now, of people in the Western world. And by Western world, I mean Japan, South Korea, the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, all of Europe. Uh, maybe with the exception of Albania, um, where lots of people are going through life never having a family. And if they do have a family, it's one or two kids. Uh, that's why I think it's really interesting if we look at people who are, and I would say, modern and uh, do have a large family. And now I'm just going to turn it over to Anne and, and see what she thinks about what I've said. And then we can just kind of go along. It'll be a, it'll be a um, kind of an ad lib back and forth uh, uh, conversation for the next hour. So, Em, take it away. <laughs> well, Mike, the, Michael, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to get those books that you wrote. Um, just hearing you talking about them, I feel intrigued, and I want to bring them to my kids and just add them to our list for our summer reading this summer. So that's on my action list to do so i'm looking forward to reading them okay um they're a well, little bit like you know maybe 15 and above so 15 and above psychological thrillers you know 
Okay, well, six of my kids are 15 and above, and I have three that are under 15. So that gives me a good uh, idea who should read and who shouldn't. So thank okay. you. Okay. So uh, what do you think? What, what is it like essentially being, I'm going to say, I mean, it, 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 doesn't it feel like an outsider when you take all the kids to the park uh, and so forth? Uh, you know, nowadays, um, I do not bring up right away when I meet people that I have nine children. And you probably don't know, but I have seven grandchildren as well. So it's not something that I advertise. Uh, but as conversations uh, go along with other people, you know, it always comes up. And I have found that as people get to know me, they are a lot more positive to, towards uh, me having a large family. However, when I was uh, younger and I go into the grocery store and they see me there with, you know, six or seven kids and a shopping cart, there, there were occasions when um, people would say just mean things. Um, I'm used to them now. They don't hurt me. But... I just couldn't understand at that point in my life why they were so against large families because I had been a dream of mine since I was a young girl. I is an avid journal writer and uh, I've kept my journals throughout the years and you go back to my, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 and in there I have just um graphs of when I was going to have a child, how old the second child was going to be, when I got pregnant with the third child. I have names of my children, the meaning of the names, um, activities we were going to do. I, I, I mapped out my life when I was 14 or 15. I pretty much knew what I wanted to do, and I just had that desire within me to have a large family. And if you know, you can call it maybe a, a laboratory, something that I could just live and experience, and I just love people. That, so is, so, that is so interesting. So, so many, uh, it seems like 13, 14-year-old um, girls today are, the only thing they can think about is Justin Bieber or One Direction, and, and the boys, they're just like, I don't know, playing video games. I think you're, you're right on there. I, but, you know, I was one of those girls, too. I had those posters up on my walls in my room. I think one of them was David Cassidy. Um, that probably lets you know how old I am, 50. Um, so, so I was one of those girls, but I just had this view in my head of what the end was going to be and what my life was going to be like. And I think that's because of the good parents I had who helped me set goals um, who uh, surrounded me with uh, good people that influenced me um, to just wanting to become something and be something and, and, and bring happiness into my life. And I felt that having people around me, having children al around me, was something that was going to be intriguing, that was going to be a learning experience and challenging, and it was going to make me happy. Well, that, that's, um, you know, when you say the thing about preparation, I'll bet that made it a little bit less tempting when your friends, and you must have had some friends, I mean, um, offer you things like, you know, cigarettes, alcohol, and all this kind of other stuff. I mean, when you start thinking about what effect that would have on your body, maybe when you realize you're going to have a family someday, you're more likely to say no. Oh, absolutely. Um even today, I just never even had a cigarette, cigarette to my mouth. I never had a drink. I'm very health conscious. I'm actually working now as a personal health coach. And um, I feel like right now at 50, it is so important for me to be in good health so I can be there for my grandchildren, be there for my children. I want to be out there kicking the ball, climbing the play structure when I'm 60. Maybe it's 65, 70. You know, I, I put my goals up high, and I need, that's how I've always done it. Uh, I think you need to do that in life. Just, just aim high and, and just go for it and be flexible in between because you do have setbacks. But just keep that hope in mind of, you know, what you can be. And so, yeah, I, I was uh, offered many things, and I didn't have the desire to even, even try. 
And that in many ways made it so that there were some people who just kind of pushed me to the side. You know, she was one of those who just didn't party. Um, but it, it, I didn't care. I didn't mind. I knew what I wanted. I was satisfied with that. And when they needed help with homework or whatever it was or questions or had troubles, they came to me, which I, I loved. I loved that because I got to be there for other people. It makes me feel good. It just makes Made me feel good. Well, quick question: um, How old is your oldest, and how young is your youngest? My oldest son, Adam, is uh, 30 years old. He is a civil engineer. He graduated from OSU, and he now works for Hewitt, which is a construction company here. Actually, it's worldwide, but he's working in Portland, Oregon, on one of the transit bridges over there. Um, and he, he's married. He has a, a lovely wife, Heather. In fact, they went to elementary school together. They went to middle school together and high school together and uh, didn't actually really connect until they were in their 20s. And it is just fascinating to see uh, them together and, and them building their lives. My youngest is 10, so I got a span of 20 years there. Uh, that's my little baby, Emma, and I'm thoroughly, just thoroughly enjoying her. Um, I think some of my older kids were really a, an experiment in some ways of me making mistakes. And not that I still don't make them, but I've learned from them, and I'm trying to, as I you know, move along, be a better grandma, a better person, uh, a better mother. Um, but that's the span between my kids, 30 and 10. Yeah, because I, I remember... I remember reading an interview one time with, I believe, it was Michael Douglas. And he'd had a couple kids, and then he got remarried when he was older. And and he was, like, the oldest person uh, in this, like, child class, you know, childbirth class or something. But he was having – he said that he had to keep himself in good shape because he wanted to be just as good as those 20-somethings who were out there is going to be, you know, playing ball with their kids and stuff like that when he was in his 50s. And so I guess in a sense, um, there's advantages at different times of your life. I mean, when you're younger, you can do, you know, you're, you have a different focus. When you're older, you have to keep in shape in order to keep up with your kids. So, um, I mean, that I, I've always noticed that people I know who, when they graduate high school and started their families – Immediately had a couple kids and then hit about 40, 45. All of a sudden they felt old. Whereas people I know who had maybe, you know, I know a few people who had like six, seven kids and they're still out there, you know, mountain climbing with their kids when they're 55, you know, because they've got, you know, a 14 year old at home or something. And, you know, I, I think that that's a real positive thing. I mean, it helps. The person it helps them in their personal growth and so forth, and also keeping in shape. Now, that's interesting. You, you're from Oregon, right? Well, originally, yeah, originally I'm from Sweden. That's where I grew up. But I came over as an exchange student, and I went back to Sweden. And it's a long story, but I ended up marrying an American from California. And for the last uh, 20 years, we just kind of made our home here in Corvallis, Oregon, and absolutely loved the. The greenery, the the close to the ocean, to the mountains, we can hike. It's it's like utopia. Yeah, yeah, it, it it's really a, a special area. But one thing that really gets me is, I've always known of of Oregon. You know, I grew up in Oregon, and uh, it's a it seems for the most part a very tolerant place. Um, you can go, you can take your wife on a date to the Portland Rodeo one day and then you, I'm not Portland, but the Eugene Rodeo on one day and then go to the Eugene Country Fair, which is like this big hippie thing the next day. I mean, and, and feel, you know, there, there's a great deal of like overlap culturally and a lot of tolerance, but you mentioned that sometimes you experienced a little intolerance in the land of tolerance. Uh, could you give me like the worst example well, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, I think the tolerance issue pretty much goes one way. Um, and those who are preaching tolerance, 
um, when it comes to an issue as having a large family, they are not as tolerant towards that as they would be to, uh, you know, many other situations, political or whatever it may be, uh, because this, uh, or, well, Oregon is a very liberal state. So, of course, within being liberal, having a large family is a big uh, taboo. Uh, you just don't do that. So I was at the grocery store uh, one time, and this is probably about 12 years ago, having a whole bunch of my kids with me, just, you know, doing what they're doing, and we're being lovely, being li- lively, happy. And, and this woman just was sitting by the cashier, and um, she right away just looks at me and tells me how I am destroying uh, the world, how I am selfish for having this many children. Uh, we're taking up the oxygen, and she just went on and on and on. And I just stood there and just looked at her, and I I just smiled, and I said, yeah, but, you know, there's nothing like having a wonderful big family. Look at these. I wouldn't trade them for anything. Yeah, you know, I might need the air. But, you know, I just went on from there. But in a way, um, you know, I got hurt when I was younger. I got more hurt. But now when this comes to me and these kind of uh, comments happen, I just try to, in a very humane way, um, try to just smile because if you just smile um, and start a conversation, it it, it kind of turns around a little bit and you can see them soften. But but it is hard. It it does happen quite often. And I think this one case particularly uh, when other people were turning around and because she was so loud in voicing her opinion and accusing me uh, of being selfish, I think that's what really kind of got to the core and hurting because being a mother the thing people know who are mothers is you are probably and have to be the most unselfish person because you're out there 24 hours a day as a full-time mom you know you're serving in a community you're volunteering at school you're staying up at night with that kid who's throwing up holding their head rubbing their back you're a taxi driver you're you know you're a little bit of everything and and so that really got to me. But then at the same time, I, I came to the conclusion that she just didn't understand. She just didn't know. And I, I felt sorry. I, I really ended up just feeling sorry for her not being able to experience the life and the happiness that I have experienced and that I am experiencing. So I actually ended up, you know, feeling sorry. And I tried to turn the situation to a positive thing when it's a good conversation and we end at a good note. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I wonder a lot of times if, if a lot of it has to do with the way that it, everything's presented in the media. I mean, I'm thinking a good example here. If we're thinking Oregon, I always think of Springfield. Um, that's where I grew up. <laughs> so, you know, but, um, but you know, the, the whole uh, Simpsons, the Simpsons series. Now, in The Simpsons, you have uh, kind of an unusual thing. You have three children presented, um, at, you know, from you know Marge and um, and Homer Simpson. And uh, but the thing is that the irony is you don't have a lot of other kids in other families. I mean, you've got you know the two sisters. They don't have uh, Marge. They don't have any kids. Uh, Homer, for the most part, is an only child. Um, which I guess I guess is kind of symptomatic of the society. I mean, if we think about it, you may have nine kids, but the average still comes out for the United States uh, slightly below two, especially with this economic recession. People are getting married even later and having less kids. And um, but going back to the Simpsons, I noticed that. You know, in that show, they do have one family that's large, and that's like this uh, hillbilly family that they sometimes present. You know, these people that talk like this and, you know, have a whole bunch of kids and cats and stuff like that. And to me, that seems to be a subtle form of brainwashing, um, whether intentional or not. Uh, you you just in the media you don't see large families presented in a positive light uh do you have you noticed that or 
Oh, oh yeah, a- ab- absolutely. And I think they try to portray families more as if you have a large family, you're you're low income, the kids are dirty, you don't have enough money, you're you're you know a leech on the government, things like that. But that's the media. You know, you know, the media is the media. Who trusts the media? I mean, anyone who is intelligent enough knows that the media, one stage or another, has an agenda of some kind. And so we got to look at real life. We've got to look at real people. And, and, you know, I look at my family. I look at other large families as well. Um, my kids, and this is the goal that I've had as a mother, is to just teach them to be independent to be those uh, individuals who to con- contribute to society, who look beyond themselves, uh, and to be part of society, to build it up. And I, I love this one quote my husband tells me all the time, and he just says that the greatest asset we have in our country and homes is really our children, and I, I think that's integrated in our family. And this is other quote that he also talks about. He says that the strength of a nation can be determined by the dreams and aspirations of its children. And this is what I'm trying to do with my children. I want them to dream. I want them to have aspirations. And I want them to become something and be part of that society that just loves to be alive, that wants to build and reach out. Uh, and I think the media portrays a completely different picture of of what large families really are. And they just don't know. I think they just need to visit, you know, large families, be with them. Maybe some of them just don't come from happy families. I, 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 don't, I just don't know. I'd invite them to come and visit and be with our family. I mean, we just love it. It's like having our own little dynasty of um, of, of people. My kids always know if they are in trouble or something happens, they have somebody they can go to, and it's family. It is a family member that's right there who's going to love them regardless. You know what's and, funny? Oh. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I, I ran across an article. I, you know, I instruct psychology in, in my real life. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, I ran across an article a few years back, and what it – what it stated, it was a study that was done on depression. And surprisingly, they found that the people that had the least amount of depression in the United States, looking at major ethnic groups, were uh, Mexicans. And they were um, saying, well, gee, you know, that these are first-generation Mexicans that they were looking at, Mexican-Americans. So they're low, they had low income and uh, for the most part. And the thing was that they concluded that the reason why they had less depression was because they came from large families where no matter what, you're going to have a cousin, uncle, aunt, brother, sister. One of those people in that large network is going to understand you, even if mom and dad don't. I mean, if you're an only child and mom and dad think that your choices you're making in life are just horrible – then you're going to really feel uh, an outcast. Whereas, you know, if you've got some choices you're making that don't seem to mesh with mom and dad, but you've got a cousin who has already made those same kind of choices, then you're going to feel a connection. You don't freaking need a psychologist. You go to a family member and talk it out and, and, and you know, go from there. That's the way people have done for millennium. And, uh, what you're saying, you know, that whole idea that there's someone who will accept you seems really, really good. Oh, that reminds me. I've talked to uh, several people of Kurdish background. For Americans, uh, Kurds live in um, in uh, eastern Turkey, and uh, eastern Turkey is down in southern Europe, and Europe's across. For, yeah, I have to give a geography lesson when I'm talking to <laughs> America's lot of times, but but anyway, that's yeah. I hope no one's got offended by that. But anyway, uh, or especially Ron Wyden, who couldn't find uh, was it Bosnia? He couldn't find on the world map that one time, you know, and he, <laughs> it, he and he voted for for sending troops to Bosnia. And he couldn't find it on the world map when he was running against uh, Gordon Smith uh, a long time ago. Um, but this uh, this particular Kurdish girl I was talking to said that. 
if she had a second cousin, and she had like 70 first cousins, if she had a second cousin living in Chicago who she'd never met, and she were to knock on the door of that second cousin and say, hello, I am so-and-so, and we're related, that second cousin would would uh, bring her into the family, try his his or her best to get her a job, and get her established as much as he could. Because that's the way these large extended families work. And if we look back at the early 19th century, how large Jewish families would work together to set up businesses and so forth. And, you know, I mean, it's it's a great advantage to the kids. I mean, if you've got a whole bunch of kids who've, who've done different things, and then, well, for no better, for, for nothing else, I mean, at least you've got business contacts for the future. Oh, absolutely. You, I, you're right on. Uh, and I don't think you know this about our family, but my father-in-law has a, a ranch up in uh, Idaho, and his dream has always been to leave a legacy and leave this ranch, leave a place for those family members. If they need to have a place to go to, this is where they can go. It's a safe haven. Anyone has a hard time anyone loses a job, you know, they need someone, this is where they can go to. And my family and I, my husband and I, um, that's where we're going to retire. That's where we have uh, cousins. That's that's where we have sister-in-laws. And it's a wonderful network that we have. But then talking about siblings, I'm thinking about within our immediate family right now. Um, I have a 14-year-old girl and I have a almost 16-year-old girl. And they have sisters who are, uh, one is 27, one is 26. And uh, a lot of times when these younger ones are coming with questions to me, and uh, maybe this is an out on my part, but I'll give them an answer. But I know it's also a controversial question because there's a teenage, they're a teenage age, and, you know, they don't want to hear certain things from mom. And so what I love now at this stage in my life is that I can say, hey, you know, I think your sister Annette went through that. Or I think, you know, your sister Lynette might be able to have a really good answer to to that question. Why don't you give them a call? Wow, you know, i got a network. It's awesome. They'll get on the phone. They'll talk to their sister or to their brother. And they'll, they'll, they'll you know, they'll come back and it happened. They'll say, oh, Mom, guess what, you know, my sister said. And, and this and this. And they're able to work it out in their own minds by talking to another older sibling who has gone through a similar experience, and, and it's a wonderful process for them to be able to come to their own cons- conclusion about what to do, what decisions to make, and how to go forward without me telling them. It, it's awesome. I mean, there's just no better way. I don't even have to pay for a therapist to do it. <laughs> I have my older kids helping out. Well, I mean, the um, the psychologist that worked with uh, Sigmund Freud, his name was Alfred Adler, he Actually, well, first of all, I like what he said. Uh, we'll get into this in just a moment. That pretty much the worst kind of child abuse you can inflict on a kid is to spoil them, <laughs> because uh, kids need the um, they need to hear no. <laughs> they need to uh, learn how to work and, and to and you know responsibility at a young age. Uh, but he also mentioned that. The children, he's the guy that started the whole birth order thing. The children interrelate with each other, and they develop within the family itself, and not everything is on the mom and dad. I mean, we have this kind of, I don't know what you would call it, Dr. Spock, Dr. Phil type of approach to life nowadays, where it seems that mom and dad are like, I have to micromanage everything my kids do. And I need to read a book to learn how to do this and this and this. Whereas, you know, your great-grandparents, they just did it. And they did a pretty good job. And if you look at most countries in the world, they just do it. They don't need someone instructing them. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of growing up is your, your, your interrelationship with your older or younger siblings. I saw that. I mean, I grew up an only child, and I saw that with people I visited, that they had a huge advantage when they were able to um, say, oh, yeah, my brother's 
teaching me how to blah, blah, blah. Uh, my sister's doing this with me. And, yeah, I was very envious of that. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, being in a family really, I think the word is that uh, humanizes us. We become really human because we have to many times just forget about ourselves on occasion uh, and so that we can keep that balance uh, of giving and not just take and receive all the time. Um, and, and so it's a really great place for all of us, mothers, fathers, and the siblings, the, the, our kids, to le- really learn and consider the rights and consider the needs of those around them. And what a good environment to do that within the family. Because if they can learn that within the family, they're, they're able to bring that outside the family, friends, you know, workplace and so forth, because they already have it as, as they leave their families and they go out into the world. And they have that ability to look beyond themselves. Yeah. Um, and now jumping back to the uh, thing about spoiling. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've got, you know, th- this is one problem I have. Yeah, my my, my uh, 10-year-old daughter, she comes home and says that every kid in the classroom has an iPhone. Every kid in the classroom is doing this and this and this. And, you know, that's kind of funny because I, I, I just remember my sons when, um, like around 10 years ago, when they were around that age. And the big issue at that time was should kids have a cell phone? I mean, that you probably remember that, you know, you had kids. Yeah. <laughs> and the big issue about 10 years ago was should kids have their own cell phone? And those cell phones, you know, that's not very expensive. And now you see 10, 11-year-old kids with uh, several hundred dollar iPhones. And I'm just wondering, a lot of these kids are just like they pester their parents. It's called the nag factor. It's it's actually, uh, for people who don't know this, there is a, a term that advertisers use that advertisers that market to children and it's called the nag factor they measure this they want the kids to sit there and say mom will you get this mom will you get this mom will you get this and the more they can get the more they can increase the nag factor the more sales they'll make and it just seems that nowadays everyone thinks my gosh you know maybe i should just have one kid because then i'll be able to buy them this and 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 I'm not sure that's a good thing for kids. Yeah, you know, that's a real disservice for children. If a parent is not able to be a parent and they come with the attitude they want to be their friend, and that's what I always say, you know, being a parent is a huge responsibility. And my kids, in society, we have laws that have to be obeyed or there are consequences. Well, in our family, we have family rules. We have chores. We also have, for example, you were bringing up the cell phone. Well, in our family, once you go to college, you get a cell phone. You are put on the family plan, and you can have a cell phone so you can communicate with your mom and dad. And, and, I mean, that's just the way it is, and our kids know that. And they know because we are consistent, and I think that's important. You have to be consistent with children. And you can't go, oh, well, maybe, or you just have to be consistent. And, and because once the rules are in place, um, it gives the children as well as a sense of security because they know what to expect. Uh, and our kids, they know the nagging is not going to do anything. If they start nagging us, it's going to be completely the opposite. And, and, and they know, okay, I graduate from school. I'll, you know, my mom and dad will put me on the, on the plan, the plan and we'll have a phone. However, we do have one phone in our family that does circulate. When uh, we drop somebody off for um, a piano recital, there's something going on. There's a practice, and we want them to be able to call us. Uh, we use the cell phone. So it's a cell phone that circulates as a need as it arises for each individual of the three children that we have right now. But the nagging in our family, no, no, doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. And our kids know we have those rules. Um, you were talking about chores, or you kind of, I think you were kind of starting to lean towards that a little bit. It's very interesting. Um, from a very early age, we always had this one poster that I put on the refrigerator that says that 
um, mom, does, mom does not give out money free. There's no free money. And so if any of my children wanted to earn some money, uh, for example, if they were invited to a birthday party and they needed to buy a present for that friend, they could go to this list that I would have on next to that other poster that would give them different jobs they can do in the house and how much they paid. That way they could choose what they wanted to do and they could add up what those different jobs would cost and they'd get enough money that they could do what they needed to do. And so, you know, we just don't give away money for free in our household. And when it comes to those chores, a lot of times they just get done because, you know, as they get older, we pay for for them to do them. However, we do have some of the younger children who are not allowed to do certain chores. And, you know, when you say to a kid they're not allowed to do a certain chore, you know, they're going to try to sneak in there and do it. And I had this one occasion, my son, Robert, He was about um, six years old, and in order to clean the bathroom, we're using the chemicals. You had to be 10. That was on my list. You had to be 10. Well, I was hearing this noise one day, walking upstairs, and lo and behold, there is my six-year-old son, Robert, cleaning the toilet with Comet. And he was looking at me like he had gotten into some huge trouble, and I just knew all I could do was laugh and hug him. And I said, you know, I appreciate you wanting to help and you wanted to clean the bathroom, but had to explain to him chemicals were dangerous. He had to wait until he was 10. But, you know, it's it's interesting, you know, kids still have that. What's forbidden or they're not allowed to do, they want to go there. But just by a certain chore like this, he learned very early on that there was a reason why he had to wait until he was 10. And, you know, we never had a problem with him you know, trying to clean the bathroom again or trying to clean the toilet, you know, before he was 10. (laughs) Well, I'll go back to those, I'll go back to those examples of, uh, you know, the Mexican families. I mean, um, I've often wondered if if you're, if you're, if you were to hire some, you know, if you're, if you're a businessman and you're going to hire someone and one kid has never had a job. They've just gone through school and had stuff given to them. The other kid comes from, let's say, some Mexican family where, you know, they had to, when he was little, they went out and had to pick, you know, beans or something to earn money to survive when they first got here. And, and they had to do all these other things just to to have money. And the kid was working at the same time going to school. And, and you have two people that have the same grades. Uh I think if you want someone to go be an entrepreneur, you would hire the the kid that's had to go through a lot of struggles. I I agree. Um, I, I look at my son Adam, for example, who's the oldest in the family, and sometimes being the oldest child in a family, it, it's hard. It's tough. You get a lot of responsibility, but boy, that is one person who is diligent. He knows how to work. Uh, if he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Uh, he, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I think sometimes it's kind of, it's kind of interesting that there's a, there's a lot of stereotypes out there for people who, who do have, uh, larger families or who, for instance, you know, let's say they're stay at home moms or something like that. And, I think the more you look at the media, the more that you're going to incorporate those just accidentally even. I mean, uh, and and that's actually to a certain degree planned. Um, The idea that most people don't realize this and they think it's like conspiracy theory when you throw it out, but yet you can go to the internet and you can find these people out here who work with population foundations and so forth, where they admit that they go to the writers and producers of television and movies, not just in Latin America, but also in uh, the Western world, and they give script suggestions, suggestions that promote such things as not getting married to maybe you're in your 30s. Uh, because and it has nothing to do with maturity or anything like that. It has to do with the fact that the longer you wait to get married, especially if you're a woman, the least, the lo- lower number of children you're going to have, even if you want to have kids. Um, 
and showing large, showing small families as the norm, and and so forth. And again, I think a lot of people will probably think, well, that sounds really Alex Jones, you know, you know. But you know, I've researched it. it it's out there. I mean. It's way worse than someone like Alex Jones would ever, you know, uh, be able to present. It's it's almost institutionalized that this is the way a woman is if she uh, lives this way. This is the way a father is. If you're fa- if you're a father of a large family, it's it, you're portrayed as oh well, you're forcing your wife to have kids. If you're a mother and you have a large family, it's like well, you must not be very bright or something. Yeah, and, and that's so sad. It's so sad because the people who fall into the trap of, of listening to that and and, and it's it, they miss out. I mean, that's all I can say. They really miss out on true happiness. A friend of mine this morning, she was sharing a uh, article that she read about a research. I'm not sure if you heard about this, but I think it was done at the Harvard University. Started in 1930 uh, about a 75-year research. I mean, it's one of the longest research projects I've ever heard about where uh, they took 286 men, I believe, uh, who were sophomores at the time, and they studied them through that period of life, and I believe most of them probably 80 right now, and looked at what made them happy. Just look about the issue of happiness. And uh, it, it was just absolutely fascinating because every time it just came back to uh, the relationships that they had with their families, the relationships they had with their spouses, um, all those kinds of things, the careers, uh, the money, the, the positions, the accomplishments in society, none of that seemed to bring them the happiness that they truly needed. I think that sometimes I look at my kids and I think of them as, you know, tender plants, and they have to be nurtured. And I can't nurture them with, you know, showing them at a show or whatever. Or they, they really have to be nurtured with a certain kind of light in their life. You know, the, the kind of nourishment they have to get from another human being, not from accomplishments. Yeah, that's the momentary, moment, momentary happiness in your life. But the lasting happiness is the relationship that you build with the people around and that you keep around you. So... Uh, I, I just think that some of these researchers and, and the media who are doing these things, uh, they're doing such a disservice to, to the future of the American people, the, the, the children, the generations that are coming up. And, and it's sad. They're, they're going to miss out. And they are, the people who are doing this are so misguided. They just don't know. They don't understand. Well, some of them are misguided. Others are doing it intentionally. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of... Um... There are a lot of uh, of these uh, people who think that they're doing it for the environment. They think they're doing it for a uh, better society. But they really do use very advanced psychological uh, techniques to be able to get people to feel bad about having kids. Um, and, and I just think that that's, that's really bad, too. But, you know, I, I just have to say this. You know, it's quite interesting what you said about accomplishments. I was uh, in Rome... Uh, about a month ago, it wasn't to see the Pope, but I was there at the same time as they were <laughs> as they were uh, announcing the Pope and everything. And the one thing I will have to note is, you know, I looked at all the ruins and, you know, and that was really spectacular. I really enjoyed that. But the one, there's two things I did note. One was the one thing that's left over from Rome. And, you know, you know, whether it's legacy of other societies that have taken laws and stuff. But the one thing that's left, one, one of the things left over from Rome struck me was pretty much all that's left is the people. So if you're riding on a subway, you're riding with people whose ancestors had children. You know, I mean, whether they're, they're, the culture eventually went into decline uh, and so forth, at least they pushed people into the future and gave hope. But then I noticed something else, and that was even when I've been in Beijing, China, I've noticed more kids in the streets in Beijing. I don't mean just on the streets or something like that, you know, but more kids, a presence of children in Beijing than I noticed in Rome. And then it struck me, well, Rome has a birth rate of now 
uh, something like one child per woman, which you need at least a little over two when you factor in things that can happen to a child. Um, you need around 2.3 children per woman average to get replacement. And they're half that. In fact, they're less than half that. And I was thinking, wow, here's this rich legacy. Here's this, the people that are left over from this really grand society. And after surviving wars and invasions from north, south, east, west for centuries, plagues and so forth, now they're just letting themselves die out. And that just struck me as really weird. And I think I just, just a second there, everyone, for some reason, I lost my guest. The Skype shut off. So I'm going to get her back. Just a moment. I really do not like it when that happens. Let's see here. And it's operating, and Anne, are you there? Or I have to tell more stories about Rome, and I don't want to do that. So, it's saying it's trying to connect. I just... Okay, while that's trying to connect, the, the other point I, I wanted to make, too, was I think there's a lot of people who... Uh, they they cut back on family because they feel like it's an environmental issue. Uh, and you're back. Ah, try again. It says my call failed. I just have to click on again. And anyway, a lot of people cut back on family because of environmental concerns and so forth. And yeah, environmental concerns are important, but at the same time, you need you need an adequate tax base to fund a lot of this, uh, these wonderful things. You need, you know, notice smaller communities, they have, you know, maybe if you have things like sewage treatment plants and recycling centers and stuff like that, they exist in larger communities where you can afford it. Now, let me see if I got my code. Ann, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I, I lost you for a second. Did you hear the part that yeah. I talked about with Rome and the culture and everything? Or had I lost you at that point? No. Are you there? Okay. This is really frustrating when this happens. Skype. <laughs> anyway, I'm getting back there again. But anyway, there's something I would like people to actually consider. And, you know, when you hear people talk about you know, maybe it's better for the environment not to have a family. Let's just take a look at what the people who have the money and so forth that are telling you that maybe it's a good idea not to have families. Um, take a look at their lifestyle. Take a look at what they're doing out there. You got, you know, situation. You know, I mean, I'm not going to say he's one of the the big. You know, he's not like an Al Gore type, but you know, you look at Obama. Um, he takes one vacation, and he probably uses more. Anne, are you there? I'm having really a lot of technical difficulties here. Well, anyway, but when Obama, you're cutting out a bit. Okay, do I have you now? Are you there, Anne? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me, Michael? Yes, perfectly clear. Ah, oh, good. I was okay. just making my point that. When Obama takes one of his famous trips, um, vacations, which it seems like that's kind of like what he does, um, he uses, if you look at all the jet planes and the motorcades and stuff like that, he probably uses more energy and resources than your family will use in their entire lifetime. You, your husband, your kids, and their spouses. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it really does bug me when people then talk about, you know, my family taking up space. I'm going, hmm, I think we can cancel at least one of those trips. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, 
there was one European monarch, and uh, I'm not going to name which country or anything, just to be nice. But anyway, he was making a big deal um, on the uh, New Year's about global warming. And he was talking about how we kind of have to all pitch in and everything. And I was just thinking, why doesn't he sell a few of his palaces and, you know, maybe move into an apartment where he doesn't have to have as much heating for the palaces? Maybe convert the palaces into uh, schools. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because I don't know if he really needs a palace or, or something like that. Well, and, and that's what we see in the world is the greed of the leaders who is taking away for the possibility of families um, flourishing and, and, and people having what they need. So you have these powerful leaders who are, are draining their countries from the, the money that needs to be put in to building up them, the third world countries. You look at these leaders who are traveling around. Holy Toledo. You know, you look at how much money they actually have. And we're feeling sorry for the people in the country when these leaders are not taking care of their own people. And that's really sad. Yeah, I agree with that. And also, I just have to look at the fact that I think in the last five years or so, people throughout much of the Western world have had an epiphany that maybe our leaders are no better than those people in those banana republics have been over the years either. I mean, you know, a lot of people right now will say, you know what? I'm not going to have a family, but I'm going to take the money I would have spent for my family, and I'm going to put it in the bank. And then someday when my 401k or blah, blah, blah pension comes in, at least I'll have a good life. And then the only thing I have to say to them is Cyprus. Take a look at Cyprus. Those guys. Yeah. That's right. You know, you you may be stuck out there. You know, I'm not saying you, but there's people maybe listening. You may be stuck out there uh, elderly no family, and suddenly your government comes along and says, oh, your banks, they did something bad and they lost their money. So what we're going to do is something really fair. We're going to go ahead and take your money out of your bank account and pay for what the banks did. And then you'll be able to maybe, if you are lucky, you might get a job as a greeter at Walmart. <laughs> I mean, it's... Oh, and Michael, can you imagine if I did that to my kids? went into their saving accounts that they worked really hard for and said, hey, mom and dad planned really bad. Sorry, but we just need to take your money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you look at that. <laughs> I think that speaks for itself. Hey, Mike, uh, Michael, there's one thing I wanted to just put a plug uh -huh. in here. When it comes to large families, you know, a large family, you're always going to have struggles come up. And the head of that family is the husband and wife. And that is one thing my husband and I have always done is we have realized the importance of the unity of us, us as a unity, always taking time for ourselves, building on our relationship. And that is huge to being successful, having a happy family. And so that is, is it's just an incredibly important ingredient to nourish your relationship as a couple in order to have a successful Family. I just wanted to give you that plug because I think a lot of people get lost in life and, and the doing of things and they don't nourish um, their relationship with that person that is the most important to them. Yes, kids are important, but that companion that you have, you're going to have for a very long time. And, 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 and it's worth the struggle and the time you spend together. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And the thing is, nowadays, I, I can't help but think that our consumer society, and again, it sounds like I'm bashing society. Well, yeah, I am bashing society. Our consumer society nowadays, um, the whole idea of when something wears out, trade it in, has been started to apply to each other to where you've got to you know, look a certain way or, or be this successful or whatever, and people feel a lot of stress in that because they're feeling like they're being judged by their neighbors. And so they buy things. I can't remember who it was. I think it was some guy named Hicks or something, a comedian, said that um, people are buying things they don't need to impress people they don't even like. <laughs> I mean, What a waste. What a waste. Yeah, and, and, and really what counts is the person you're married to and the kids you bring up 
and because th- those are going to be relationships that are going to last forever. And if you and if you don't, I mean, you, you know, your your four hundred one k, your bank account is as safe as you trust the government not to take it from you. Now, if I'd have told people a year ago that, well, in Cyprus, guess what? Your government might try taking your money. They'd have been like, yeah, right, sure. That doesn't happen. This is a democracy. Well, it's already being, you know, talked about in the rest of the EU. And then you got people in America probably going, hmm, that's a good idea. So ser- so seriously, I mean, you, and you can be replaced in your job in a microsecond. How many people have wound up, you know, getting their, getting outsourced someplace they worked 20 years? I mean, what really is, I think what really counts is family, and we got to get back to that. And maybe in the future, we need to actually start thinking about families like your family getting together and forming um, some sort of cooperatives and so forth. It sounds like you guys have that, where you could go to Idaho and, you know, if things got bad, you could all kind of congregate and help each other. We got about a minute left, so I'm going to give you that last minute. Oh, okay. Um, well, the one thing I've been thinking about through all of our, our discussion here is that, and you just mentioned this, how people just tend to give up or trade something in for something new. And I think uh, there's one thing that we have in our family is that when the heat is on, do we turn it into a refiner's fire or just let it burn us out? And I think it's important in any situation, whether it be politics or in, in a family or racing or, or, or a couple, is for you to just make 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 that wonderful piece product that you can make by living through it and, and i mean it's 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 really just worth it don't let it just burn you out go through it but with you supporting each other you can do it you can do it but you cannot do it alone you have to do it together so just get through the refiner's fires and the result that you will get will be something ex- incredible Excellent. Hey, thanks. Thanks for being on. It's been a great hour and just wish you a great weekend. And um, again, thank you very, very much for sharing um, your experiences, Anne. All right. Take care, Michael. You too. Um, Catch you later. Bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. That wraps up the hour for Unlock the Door.